Well, good morning. Hope you enjoyed your networking break and are ready to resume what I'm sure will be one of the highlights of our two days together as our stragglers come in who are, I'm sure, bending Chairman Quackenbush's ear over his presentation. Our next presenter this morning uh, is Quinn Shea. He's the Vice President for Environment of the Edison Electric Institute. And uh, as a result of some of our scheduling changes, John was able to uh, expand a little more on his comments, and Quinn will have some ability to do that as well. Uh, and so he will be offering comments, and then as we did in the uh, first sessions this morning, we'll be doing some Q&A after that, and I think you will probably have some great questions for Quinn. And so with that, I will not take any more of his time, and Quinn, the floor is yours. Good morning, everybody. It's nice to be back here. Uh, first, I want to thank Eloise, Ben, and the rest of the World Events team. They do a fabulous job. They run a tight ship. Uh, at EEI, uh, my team and I, we get inundated with uh, lots of requests. We could do road shows, you know, and never step foot in D.C. or in the office. And we're fairly selective about the groups we talk to in terms of are they high value for the CEO community of the investor-owned utility community. And we found that this is one of the ones that is. It's a really good, I think, uh, mix of very smart technical people, some politically and policy savvy individuals as well. And so thank you for the opportunity again to be here with all of you. Um, what I'm going to do today is I've got, I've got some slides and uh, I'm going to go, th I'll obviously we'll go through those. Some of them are, are really more intended as a handout or a leave behind for you. We have found, particularly in the context of the 111D existing source rule, that some, in terms of how you explain that uh, particular rule to certain audiences, particularly lay audiences, we found certain messaging works better. So I've got some of that. I'm not, we're not doing tutorial 101 or 202 here today. What I'm going to do instead is hit what, I, what I've done in the past with you is what I think are some of the key punchlines uh, on some of the major issues that are in play uh, right now before our community. Again, my prism is through the CEOs of the investor-owned utilities. I'll be very clear if I'm speaking on behalf of EEI, which is effectively our board, or I'll be very clear if I'm talking in terms of my own personal opinions. And if I offer those, and if I get crosswise with any of my clients in the, in the room, I assure you they'll, they'll take me to task on that. I will, do, I will do some projections. I won't do projections as to where EEI or our industry will end up, uh, but I think it will be interesting. All right, just a little bit about us. That's, we represent all the investor-owned utilities, so I'm not here speaking on behalf of the munis and co-ops, but they are obviously valuable uh, allies in, ma in many of these issues, with one or two wrinkles, which I'll mention. All right. Uh, all right. I'm going to, what I'm going to do here contextually, what I really want to do is get into some of the hot issues, ending with most of my time spent on carbon. I'm going to give you a short front porch here, a few contextual points, really short, like trailer park short, and just so that you sort of understand where I'm coming from. What we're thinking about these days right now, uh, and we just had one of our major CEO meetings a week ago in Las Vegas. We actually had a couple of hours of private downtime, very robust, with Gina, who sort of came out. Uh, spur of the moment uh, to meet with the CEOs at the request of the White House. It's a good discussion. I'll give you some highlights from that. But these are kinds of things uh, outside of sort of the environmental policy space that are driving our decisions. What do we have to build and when? How much is it going to cost? What are the sort of regulatory overlay? Uh, new transmission, new generation. Obviously, there's pockets of flat growth, pockets where uh, growth is more feasible in the country. Uh, all, that's, all that's sort of in consideration. Still top of mind for the CEOs. I mean, right now we're building nothing but gas. It's gas, gas, gas. Sure, we're concerned long term about what are the gas prices, not just domestically, but internationally. Is there going to be any boomerang effect here in the next five to ten years? Or can we take the gas providers at their word that the prices are going to be cheap forever? Yeah. Pipeline capacity. We're going to solve some of those issues. Some places are more constrained than others. Uh, we're, we're focused on that. That goes into the calculus. We have any fracking issues at EPA? Probably not. That's probably going to come out well. But so obviously we're watching the gas space. But again, that's what we're building. Obviously some renewables and efficiency in the cracks. That's the universe. Nuclear is pretty pretty flat. If I had my choice, I'd like to build a nuclear plant first, but I don't have my choice. And we're of course building no coal right now. It's all about which plants are being sacrificed. The un the older, under controlled units, and which ones are the cash cows. It's basic economics 101. 
This slide is a good one. I've used this one before, and I always update it. And I think it's one that is useful to all of you uh, in terms of different audiences that you talk to. This is sort of the, the where you sit is where you stand slide. And this is a very factual, accurate uh, depiction of the different fuel sources by regions in the country, and it's and pretty accurate uh, on a state-specific basis. Obviously, different governors, different utility commissioners, different rate payers and companies have different choices depending on where you are. Some choices are not available to you. So make no mistake, when we're talking about in the environmental regulatory space, the environmental political space, this is very much top of mind for the people that, we're, that we talk to, like the chairman, like the former chairman. They understand this, and it's at the root of a lot of the messaging and the advocacy that we do within the electric sector. All right, this is this one you know too. This is sort of intuitive, being sort of uh, Captain Obvious here. Coal and gas uh, pieces are getting are getting closer. They're going to overlap, and gas is going to overtake coal. It's simply the way it's happening. We were at 55, uh, 55 percent coal about 10 years ago. That's going down, and it will continue to go down for the reasons that I mentioned. All right, we got we have op serious operator error here. There we go. All right, I want to spend a few minutes on this one. You've seen this before, but this is updated every year. This was done last fall by our CEO community. Basically, at any one time, we've got about 50 environmental policy issues that we're working on because a significant subset of the industry is interested in it. Some of the issues are obviously regional in scope. These are the bigger ones. At any one time, you probably have 20 issues that kind of are on the CEO's radar screen. Maybe half a dozen of those are ones that are sort of in their short list of big ones. Right now, for our, in the investor-owned utility community, anything having to do with physical and cyber security, anything having to do with sort of distributed generation, that's the rooftop versus central solar issue is a good example of that, and the utility model of the future, that's huge. Anything related to taxes is big. And then the fourth bucket, which is, tends to be omnipresent from any year to year, is the environmental bucket. And right now, anything related to carbon, You've got three big rules. The existing source rule is the biggest, but the new source rule, the modified and reconstructed units rule, that's huge. Almost anything in the water column in water world is big too, and you're going to get some presentations on that, I think, on both 316B and effluent guidelines. Those are huge. Uh, so th these are the big ones. Now, starting on the left-hand side, the air, air side, you know, the gifts that have, keep on giving and have since 1970. You look down here, just a couple of punchlines for you. On mats, we've been through that. We're all trying to comply, figuring out, again, what plants to shut, which ones to retrofit. One thing you need to know sort of in the policy arena, we're coming up to a very important deadline, sort of an unofficial deadline. This fall, you're, you'll start finding out from the companies uh, in, in our community anyway, which ones are going to need that supposed fifth year extension. Remember, this is a three-year compliance window. You get an optional fourth year, which the states have liberally granted. We project that somewhere maybe a dozen companies are going to have requests in for a fifth year. That puts you in an enforcement bucket, very dicey landscape to be in if you need that additional time. So those announcements will come late, but they're coming soon, so watch for those. And so obviously uh, that will be of interest to some of the vendors. A little farther down on the air list, we obviously had, uh, you know, Casper. Uh, EPA was vindicated on Casper. And you heard the, the regional administrator um, reminding us of that, and that's fine, but there's a lot of residual issues there. And this was an interesting uh, uh, regulatory issue in the sense that it, it pitted, you know, there were a lot of st sort of odd bedfellows relative to the allowance allocations and other issues. All those residual issues were not litigated. So we, we project right now, another punchline, about a two to three year window before you see sort of the son of Casper fully manifest. That's the, that's the window that we're looking at for when we, we see what the sort of the new program is. A little farther down, NACs. Uh, we, we were joking at our table this morning. I said, I'm so focused on carbon and some of the water issues, you kind of forget that, you know, S for SO2, PM, ozone, which, you know, for us is NOx, those things are reviewed and revised, you know, every five to seven years, like clockwork. I mean, you can set your watch on those. And there's some big ones out right, right now. EPA is on the cusp of revising the ozone standard and the fine particle standard. Those are going to be a big deal. And we have the one hour or, or short term SO2 standard. That's out there too. I didn't, I had to be reminded, thank you Westar, uh, the criticality of that issue in the near term. So these are still going. I would want to comment on a couple, uh, this is a good place to comment. 
uh, the confluence of these rules, two factors that I think are always on the minds of the CEO, certainly us at EEI. One of them was the economic question. This is very important. As we're deciding which plants to close, I mean, these are straight economic decisions. The fact of the matter, and you guys know this better than I do, that you can, some of these coal plants might be one of the major, if not the, source of jobs and tax base for specific counties across the U.S. So these are, this is a big deal. The other item that obviously comes into play here, no one's mentioned polar vortex. It's like the new four-letter word. Gina hates that phrase. But the fact of the matter is we were running a lot of these plants that are going to be shuttered here in the next couple of years full blast uh, during the winter. Well, what happens in the next two years when they really do get shut? Are we going to hope for mild weather? That's not a sustainable policy trajectory. Just food for thought. Skip the climate column. Water, water world, huge deal. I've been saying for years, I said last year, it sounds like a broken record. This is where we're starting to spend a lot more time and emphasis. These are a big deal. Now, 316B, we just had a final rule. That was a pretty successful result for our industry. And, and I'm going to crow about that one. And in fact, I'm going I'm to pick on there's a handful of companies, Exelon, PSENG, PG&E, Next Era, Dominion, Duke, Entergy and Dominion. Those guys carried the ball on this issue. They won this through a lot of shuttle diplomacy in the last couple months. But it was basically a rule that we can live with. It was a rule had it come out the wrong way would have been a disaster. And I mean of, of a, car, a bad carbon uh, policy uh, level of pain. It was a good rule, a lot of hard work. I think it demonstrates that you can produce good results if you want. Something I've mentioned to this group before, I'm fond of, of uh, quoting the great philosophers, Mick Jagger and the rest of the Stones. The difference between the investor-owned utility community, I'm just going to leave you with a punchline that's going to make some of you sour, some of you chuckle, and some of you just irritated. And the fact of the matter is, the reason that we're able to get results like 316B, the reason that we're able to get results, again, personal view, of a MATS rule that is workable, not perfect, not inexpensive, but workable relative to what the proposal was, that was because of the investor-owned utility community. The reason we're able to get those is because when we go in and talk to Lisa Jackson or Gina McCarthy or folks at the White House, we go in with a list of things that we need and not a list of things that we want. It amazes me how many industries outside of the electric sector still haven't gotten it. The environmental community hasn't got it either. They've got lots of want, want lists. We succeed because we go in with things that we need. We're going to need that to work on some of these other issues. I want to pick on one. There are some aberrations, though. That constructive relationship isn't going to work. You can't put enough lipstick on the waters of the U.S. pig. It is not possible. That is a disaster of a proposed rule. A couple months ago, EPA kind of snuck that out. It was the classic thing. If you got bad news, wait till Friday night after, after the newspapers have closed shop and it's right before a holiday weekend or something. Well, guess what? This one kind of got snuck in. It is a horrible rule. I think of this one as sort of environmental or energy policy zoning. I mean, if, if, you know, we laugh about it, but basically you have, you, you, have so, you have multiplied exponentially the potential exposure of all of our operations, plants, transmission, uh, distribution facilities, just because of their potential connectivity, potential by, through intermittent waterways to other water bodies that might be miles and miles away. I mean, it is a disaster of a proposed rule. Now. Uh, EPA extended the common deadline. Did they do it by 30 days because we needed more time? No, they did it by multiple months. What does that tell you? Punchline. They're in trouble and they know it. I will predict that this one is going to be further delayed and maybe it will, you know, this proposal will die the death that it deserves. Watch that one, folks. All right, a couple, couple over here. Transmission and siding. Even as we're working the substance of a lot of these issues, something that's very near and dear to the CEO community is how fast can you get these things cited and permitted? Sure. Problem's not state level. Problem tends to be more at the federal level. Problem's not even EPA. It's more with the federal land managers. And this is another place, punchline moment. We spent a lot of time working with DOE, a lot of time with EPA. Pay attention to what the Bureau of Land Management and the, the, the Park Service and the Forest Service, watch what they're doing watch what they're doing relative to their sister agencies on these major environmental rules. We saw it pop up, you know, sort of humorously in the context of, you know, plants in the Midwest are killing polar bears. So we saw the polar bear carbon connection a few years ago when we were working on carbon legislation. 
but you're seeing it more now. We saw it in 316B, where the environmental community suddenly have found newfound friends, some of the career staff in the, in the federal land management agencies, doing everything possible to make every day a bad one for Gina McCarthy and her team, and they almost succeeded. So all I'm, all I'm saying is, in the context of endangered species, an endangered species set of issues, and anything having to do with permitting and siting, pay attention to what's happening over at Interior and Agriculture and Commerce. It's important. Coal ash, last one before we sort of switch gears and pivot towards carbon. Another priority issue. So in the environmental bucket, I spoke about almost anything in the water column, carbon, uh, air issues as they pop up, and coal ash are the ones that sort of uh, float the boat right now. This rule is going to go final in December. That is going to happen. That is an absolute guarantee. It has nothing to do with the fact that it's a, uh, on a court-ordered schedule. It's going to happen. Gina wants to finish this off. We want to finish it off. Piece of good news here. I think borrowing, and this is sort of a projection, personal view, not an EEI or board, EEI board view. Personal view is that this issue will be resolved. It will be a non-hazardous determination, and we think that this will be a workable rule. I think the infrastructure is in place right now. Uh, with direct hands-on involvement by the CEOs in our community. This effort is led by Nick Akins at AEP uh, to basically almost negotiate the outcome of this rule. This is one we feel fairly confident on. We are going to have to make concessions. I use the term loosely, you know, in the wake of the TVA and uh, Duke incidents. Um, legacy sites are, are, are definitely on the table. Those would not have been part of this rule. They're definitely on the table now. CEOs understand that. They understand it better than their staff. Uh, so, again, we just project that this rule will be over by the end of the year, and I'm projecting a favorable outcome. I feel like I'm projecting on election eve or something here. All right, let's go. Let's go to carbon. Have I? One. All right. It's, here we go. All right. We'll skip that. Starting the carbon, again, you guys know this. The trend, the trend line in the electric power sector has been pretty good. Uh, in over the last 10 years. Our emissions have been down. Intensity has been coming down. Now it's been kind of a mixed bag. Certainly, uh, there has been a lot of improvement in the fleet. You know, the fleet is turning over. We're going through what our CEOs call a fleet transition. It's a sort of a 10 to 15 year window where we're, things are being turned over. Uh, a lot of the older, smaller, uncontrolled, uneconomic plants, they're going away. Uh, a lot of the new build is obviously cleaner, so we're cleaner and more efficient. That's happening. That's just the way it is. It makes sense for our customers. Customers are number one. But, but it's also been on the backs of a pretty crappy economy. Now, I think all of us would agree that that is not a sustainable trajectory. We don't want that. The economy is improving. You've already seen in the last year there was a slight uptick. So obviously our emissions would be coming up. So good news, but a lot, a lot to be done courtesy of EPA. All right, let's get to what really matters here. And here, let me just uh, a mea culpa. I started off by saying there's a lot of smart people in the room, and I told Richard that you know, I know that. I mean, and I'm a dim bulb. I'm an attorney. I'm a lobbyist. I'm from Washington, D.C. That means you have to trust me. That just means, but it also means I'm not as smart as you. So I, I told Richard that I would do, I would acknowledge my limitations because I'm a lawyer. So I've done that. I've checked that box. So you need to report to the professor, Ralph Izzo, that I've done that. Now, You've got this is out. And the other thing that I want to, again, another mea culpa, the investor-owned utility is in a little different place on the carbon issue than a lot of other industries. Even our sister uh, organizations among the co-ops and munis, we historically are not afraid of this issue. We've embraced it on the policy and political level. We supported climate legislation. I know, I know. I need a scarlet letter. We did. We supported it because we thought it was the way to go. I'll tell you right now, if we were to take an, in, an objective poll based on, if you, if you offered me Waxman Markey right now, I'd have taken it. But we had a chance a few years ago. We didn't get that. So now we're going the EPA pathway, for better or worse, which I think is infinitely worse way to go. We supported legislation. We are going to work with the administration and Gina and her team on this rule. And I think that if you've been watching very carefully, it's been a lot of, you know, it's been a firestorm of press. You know, the environmentalists are fully engaged. Republican lawmakers are fully engaged. You haven't really heard anything out of our community. And I'm not just talking about sort of the cleaner, so-called cleaner companies. I'm even talking about the heavily coal-based companies. Our CEOs have decided 
that it is more prudent right now to sort of keep their powder dry and to basically work this. Think about the mats example that I provided in 316B. There's always going to be litigators out there that are going to challenge the heck out of every final rule. That's great. They'll have their time in a year. Before we get to that point, I am interested in, in exacting as many changes, favorable changes, in this proposed rule as possible. You don't do that by taking a stick and shoving it through someone's eye at EPA or on the Hill. You don't do that. I know it's fun. I used to do that. I was in the mining industry. It was like, it was like daily sport. I mean, we just, if you couldn't go a day without bashing somebody. It just doesn't make sense. Our goal is to exact as many favorable changes. In fact, change the baseline for when people do litigate, when states do have to implement. It's hopefully a lot better than this proposal, and it needs, it needs some changes. So, but just wanted to sort of acknowledge that, that we have a slightly different baseline. I'm going to zip through the next series of slides. Again, this is sort of what I call the sort of 101, 202, how the rule is set up. Janet did a little bit of this this morning. You've got other speakers that will hit that as well. You don't want to hear it 12 times in four different languages. But you, and you will have these slides. But quickly sort of skim through some of these. Again, I'll just hit some punchlines. This is an interesting chart. It's in the proposed rule. Everyone looks at this and it's like, wow, you immediately start focusing on where's my state, you know, where's my, you know, where's my uh, fleet footprint, and it's just a bunch of numbers. Let me tell you what's interesting about this chart and really why it's also a bit of a red herring. Obviously, these are the targets. These are the 2030 targets uh, for the different states. And you look at them and you've got some really big numbers and you have some comparatively pretty small numbers. And, all, and sometimes those are in states that are adjacent to one another. And you're like, well, how the heck did that happen? Well. We've all heard that basically this is a rule that EPA is projecting. They're using a 2005 baseline and want to show 30 percent reductions nationwide. The aggregate of these 48 states, Vermont and D.C., are out, but basically a 30 percent reduction aggregate nationally by 2030. Now, it is interesting to me, I'll just point out a little poke of the, of the bear, that they get a 2005 baseline for purposes of showing their improvement but all my clients got stuck with a 2012 baseline. We didn't see that one coming. We thought that we were going to get a 2005 baseline. Why does that matter? Well, again, you look at some of these state targets. I will just offer an opinion, an educated opinion at this point based on my much smarter staff's view, that if you were to basically take any one of our company, company X, that has done a substantial amount of coal plant closures and efficiency improvements and building more renewables between 2005 and 2012, you'd think intuitively that they probably would have been rewarded by that and their state would have been a beneficiary of that to the extent that it might have had some effect on their 2030 target. Some places yes, some places no. In effect, I would argue that some of these early actors almost got penalized because all it did, EPA baked everything that was done in that sort of 2005 to 2012 window into the baseline for each of these state targets and said, guess what, it's a new day. Pat you on the back, it's like you're a seven-year-old, you're getting a participation medal at a summer swim team event or something. So it was like, thank you very much, and then you got a really strict target. Now that's not always the case. When asked if there was a correlation between what states had already done and the setting of their 2030 target versus states that maybe in companies that hadn't done as much in that window and their target, EPA has refused to answer that, and that's very telling. So you have to bear that in mind. Long way of saying that these numbers really don't bother me right now. Some of these numbers are going to change, okay? And that's, that's, that's good news. But there's some interesting ones on here, too. Punchline time. We had our CEOs met a week ago. It was a very illuminating discussion. Again, no nouns here, but what emerged from that discussion is that you have you know, historically on some of these environmental policy issues, you could, you could sort of tell, like in any industry, how the CEOs are going to break on an issue. You know, are they, east, are they downwind states or upwind states? Are they heavy coal or not? Well, remember the CASPER model and the allowance allocations fight. Here, it's a little different because it's very, these are state-specific targets. And I would suggest to you, by accident or design, you end up with some very odd bed, bedfellows here because it's all about what the state target is. So you've got some states... In fact, you've got a state out west, I would say one of the brightest red states, saying to their companies, well, hold on a second, let's, let's take a closer look at this. Signal came back from the C one of the CEOs operating that state. 
well, we're not sure we entirely hate this rule yet. I was like, wow. And then I looked at California, I looked at some of the Reggie states, and, and my opinion, my opinion, Shannon, my opinion that you had like, you know, California's got AB 32, you've got the Reggie states, and they thought that coming into this, they were like, they pass go, collect $200, and there's probably very little they're gonna have to do. Well, guess what, that's not the case. California's got some problems right now because they're gonna have to back out all of their, all of their offsets. So it's not that easy. New Jersey has got some challenges right now. Are these insurmountable? No. But all I'm saying is there are some prizes here, coast to coast, for every state. And it has nothing to do with philosophy or what their fuel mix is. It has all about to do with how EPA calculated their numbers. All right. And that's what they've done here. So I talked about the baseline, the baked in, the 2012 baseline. Everyone's got a baseline. EPA did several things here. Keep it simple. They started with what you've done historically, that's in the baseline. They then projected, they looked at your footprint, all the company's footprint right now, what is occurring in those states and in those companies. Okay, they calculated that. And then, they, then the best, of course, because this is like gambling, so what is this company and this state going to be doing over the next 10 years? Well, we know that State X has a renewable portfolio standard program, and they're gonna, they've got legislation passed because they're going to get here by 2015 and here by 2020. They've got efficiency programs. That was put in. So basically projecting future actions by state sovereigns that may or may not come to pass, depending on changes in government, for example, those are, those are in the EPA projections. And so when they started you know, putting together their projections, then they've layered in these sort of four building blocks. Those get mentioned, but basically you know what those are. It's sort of on-site efficiency improvements. It's you know, sort of the cold gas. It's, it's all of your non-emitting or low-emitting renewables and nuclear and your end-use efficiency. Another punchline here, this is kind of obvious. You saw this within 10 minutes of starting to read this rule. A year ago, six months ago, we were having the conversation, the lawyers loved, still love to have it, about the whole inside the fence line, outside the fence line. Remember that stuff? Okay, red herring. Because, and it'll come back, but basically saying, well, EPA can only regulate in the box inside the footprint of the plant. And so that's all you can do. They can't be looking at, you know, stuff outside the plant fence line. And then some CEOs say, well, maybe they can look at stuff that's on my side of the meter, you know, transmission, distribution. But all the CEOs were saying, anything outside of my control, end use efficiency, what the customer does, how in the heck am I supposed to control what the customer does? How can you hold me accountable for that? And obviously, end use efficiency, that's part of the equation now. So EPA, any thought of this inside versus outside the fence line, it's purely a legal issue for a year from now. And it'll be in a lot of people's comments. It's not something that EEI will spend a lot of time on. Again, I'm focused on fixing what's in this proposal based on the paradigm that EPA has presented to us. That is our, that's our mindset. But it's, an, it, again, an interesting factoid about where they went. Um, and, and I'll talk about later, and sort of in more of my comfort zone, sort of the political and legal aspects of some of these issues, why I think they're going to get away with it. You've got this, we've got the two options. Again, these are very straightforward. They're articulated in the proposed rule. Option one is the main one. The second option is basically you can use a couple of building blocks along with an agreement to severely cut uh, your, your output in effect. So that, that will mature a little bit because right now we don't think it's particularly viable, but it could be. The se that second option could be attractive to a lot of companies depending on how EPA might be willing to modify it. This is great. I don't understand it. See, this is that dim bulb thing. But this is an even, to me, this is even a better depiction of Susan's formula. But the place I'll, I want to point to, so you've got, you've got the in, inside the fence line, you know, the plant efficiency improvements, and you've got the sort of the cold gas, and you've got the, the, the nuclear renewable space, and I finally have the end use. That's the equation that they use for each state. Now, let's just look at that upper left box as an example. Again, I am not as smart as you guys, but I've talked to a number of you, and I, there is no way, no way that any of our companies are going to hit that 6% number. That's just not feasible. You, you talk to plant managers, and they say, well, maybe 1%, 2%, maybe I can, get, I can squeeze 2.5%. I'm not sure if it's sustainable, but that's the numbers we're talking about. Where in the hell did 6% come from? That's an aggregation of a lot of very interesting projections from EPA, which we would like, we're, we're looking forward to talking to them about that. But then, of course, it doesn't matter if building block one doesn't work entirely for you. Say you can only get, you know, one or two percent. You've got these three other building blocks to play with, which then sets up the question, are all, the, are all four blocks reasonable or are they aggressive? Details matter. 
All right, so we've got uh, another interesting wrinkle here. I think this is a helpful one. Again, borrowing sort of a page from Matt's. One thing that we, you know, Matt's had the, you had the deadline, you got the one year potential extension, and then two years if you want to go in the enforcement bucket, different. Analogies are dangerous, but here, same thing. And I like this, that what EPA has done. Uh, you've actually got the chance, you, you know, 2016, 2017, possibility even of a second year if you go into some sort of a regional compact. So this is very important. There's no question, no one should be under any illusion as to EPA's stated policy objective here of getting as many states as possible to join with their neighboring states to effectively forward, form uh, regional compacts. It's effectively building a national program through, through these regional things. Not necessarily a bad idea, but it's important for you to be thinking about how that advantages you uh, or, or not as you, as you, as you move forward. Um, the, uh, the other thing, the other punchline I want to leave you with, and this is sort of anecdotal, leading up to this proposal, a lot of our conversations, a lot of the CEO conversations with Gina and her team included several things. You know, we can't dictate what we wanted to see, but there were things that we didn't want to see. One of the things we didn't want to see was the so-called pancaking effect. For us, you know, there's a multitude of things. We saw that silo chart with, you know, there's two dozen issues on that. But the one thing that really mattered on there, probably most of all in the next few years, is the MATS rule, the rollout of that. This is where we're making huge, huge economic decisions about what to retire, what to retrofit, and what to build going forward. You guys all know that. We also know took a straw poll, if you took a straw poll of the CEO community, and let me leave out a, a couple of aberrations. I mean, you're never going to optimize on like a Kemper if you're Southern, but, in, but for the most part, 90 plus percent of the CEOs would tell you that they probably um, get back to e even on their MATS investments somewhere in the 2021, 2022 range. Well, what do we have here? It's interesting that going forward that you've got sort of the first reportable moment for the companies happens to be 2022. The key decade is 2020 to 2030, but these sort of rolling two-year reportable moments where you have to demonstrate progress start in 2022. That's not by accident. So they did listen. I'm going to skip that. Just example of things. This, you know, we, we started trying to get our head around, you know, what counts and what doesn't. And I'm going to lead to, I'm going to mention uh, what I think is going to be a very, very important event that's occurring tomorrow uh, with EPA. But here, this is just an example of some of the things that count, some of the things that don't. It's very confusing. I'll give you, I'll give you one example of something that's very confusing. Gina, by her own admission, she focused heavily on the preamble and the proposed rule because, in effect, those are statements of her intent. Those are statements of the administration's intent in, relative to the president's legacy. But underneath, underneath the the sort of the beautiful stuff, the proposal and the preamble, you've got lots and lots of support documents, the technical support documents, okay? Those were not that well written. There's, clear, there's a lot of Scrivener error. There are some discrepancies and inconsistencies between the underlying documents and the proposed rule. That's a problem. It's a problem for us. It's a problem for EPA. Sort of an anecdote, and this is sort of, this is how serious this is. Uh, I, would have, I would have bet until about six weeks ago that this rule was going to come out proposed at the end of June. That was what the White House staff assumed. That's what EPA, uh, Gina and her team assumed. That's what I assumed. But then something happened. There was a public announcement by a, one of the EPA officials who actually said, yeah, when you see this thing in late June, we can begin to talk. And some of the press, a couple of the environmental said, what are you talking about late June? The president said that it's June 2nd. That was an embarrassing moment. That little gaffe cost us three to four weeks because the next morning, EPA had to issue a retraction, say the rule's coming out on June 2nd. The EPA technical staff at headquarters in RTP in North Carolina were ready to shoot themselves in the head because suddenly they had lost three to four weeks that they needed. I'm telling you right now that a lot of the documents that were produced last in this proposal are those technical support documents, and there is a lot of what I will mildly call Scrivener error. So these uncertainties and inconsistencies, they abound. One, one classic example, this is a great one. We already know you're not getting credit for stuff you did between 25 and 2014 when it was proposed. But what about everything you do now in terms of closures and efficiency improvements between 2014 and 2020? Well, Gina has said, her, 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 her A team have all said, well, you're going to get credit for all that. And I believe them. That's her intent. Well, guess what? 
The underlying documentation doesn't support that. It says you do not. That's got to get fixed. That can't stand. All right. Well, they're obviously going to evaluate the state programs, blah, blah, blah. We know that. So, but as I said, some of these, this is, this is a nice way to sort of talk about what they're doing. But I want to skip that. All right. I got, I'm going to skip a lot here. All right, tomorrow, I mentioned a milestone tomorrow. When Gina met with our CEOs last week in the ARIA, no, no less, it was interesting, a two-hour discussion in, the, in, a, in, a, in a casino, why not, right? Um, it was a very robust discussion, and one of the things that came out of that was that point I talked about clarifications and things that they have to fix. Um, and tomorrow, we've got a lot of the EPA staff sitting down with the investor-owned utilities. We also invited our friends in the co-ops and munis Nehruk, Ecos, to listen in, a couple of others, to go through all those issues. We've amassed about six pages and dozens and dozens of these points of clarification and inconsistency. Very important to you because what that means, we have to get resolution. Whether I like or don't like what I hear, I have to know how those issues are resolved so, what I really, so I know what my intellectual baseline is as I prepare to develop comments on the proposed rule. So that's going to happen tomorrow. You'll want to look for the sort of outfall uh, from that and see what comes out of that. It will answer a lot of the questions that we're right now are evading us. All right, I'm going to blow through these fast. D.C. Circuit, I, I sort of hinted at this. EPA is on a good run right now in the court. Fact of the matter is they are getting a lot of deference. And the fact of the matter is, you know, that inside the outside the fence line thing, I think it's a red herring. I think they're going to win on this. And the reason is very simple. You look at what happened in Mercury. Mercury, the rule came out okay from my perspective. But the fact is, EPA went, jettisoned the Bush rule, rewrote the docket, reinterpreted Section 112 N1A. I mean, really reinterpreted it, whole cloth. And the court said, fine. Reasoned, logical, detailed decision by EPA. They won. Here, B B EPA is basically reinventing their interpretation of Section 111D. I don't know if it's reasonable or unreasonable. A lot of lawyers are saying you can't do that. Well, it remains to be seen. The other thing, this is the world I live in. Five years ago, the D.C. Circuit was seven Republican appointees and two. Right now, that's flipped, including the chief judge. Folks, if EPA does their homework and they write rules uh, to protect themselves against litigation, they're not going to lose another major environmental regulatory case in the next five to ten years. Book it. Congress, next to useless. We know that. So <laughs> I, I, don't, I, don't, I, I forget the talking points in the interest of time. They're not doing anything. They're not doing anything. A pox on both houses. Democrats are blocking robust conversation. The, the Republicans are doing oversight, some of which is valuable, some of which is not. So obviously we're focusing a lot on the administration. It ties back into my point that that's the game. Like it or not, like us for doing it or not, the fact is we are, we, are, we are winning some of these issues in terms of shaping these rules and we'll continue to do it. House, it's going to stay Republican. We know that. All that matters is the Senate. Republicans need a net gain of six. I want to share one thing with you here. You all listen to the bobbleheads and I don't care what your, your news venue of choice is, whether it's MSNBC, CNN, or Fox, it doesn't matter. The fact is they, everyone talks about projections. Who cares until after Labor Day, right? Well, they all talk about, you know, red state, blue state, and who's going to win. We have a different take on that, and we're very close to this. We are a political organization. What I want to show you, and obviously these are, all the, these are all the folks that are up, 21 Democrats, 15 Republicans, and this matters. But really what it comes down to is this map, and this is the one that matters. This is not the current state of play. Gray states are not, uh, are not in play. Blue and red, not, it's not what's happening right now. You'll see on there, you know, the bobbleheads talk about, well, you know, maybe Udall's vulnerable in Colorado or Warner, Virginia, bullshit. They stay blue. Uh, but you also see that South Dakota and West Virginia, they flipped to red on my map because those are guaranteed takes for the Republicans. So your new count right now is 48 to 46. Republicans have to pick up five of those six gold, gold states. Folks in this room, if you're interested in this at all, those are the six states that you need to watch over the next couple months in terms of what's happening there. Landrieu, Pryor, very vulnerable. We actually love Mary Landrieu. Uh, that would be a loss, we think, for our industry, but she's vulnerable. Begich, uh, obviously. Senator Walsh, who took Baucus a seat, very vulnerable. Uh, Hagan, vulnerable. You've got one Republican seat in there, Georgia. You've got Sam Nunn's daughter uh, looking to take down, uh, that, take, take down that seat. 
this is what you need to watch for, I think. This is just a simplification of all that crap you get on the evening news. It's moving forward. Things are moving forward. We're not going to stop it. These are, I think these are, these are intuitive, these sort of uh, endpoints. Um, maybe congressional action if the Senate flips, because at that point, the Con Congressional Review Act, more oversight from the Senate. The House maybe is emboldened to exercise the power of the purse string, which they won't do right now and, and split. So maybe some more activity uh, in Congress becomes a player in the regulatory policy space if the Senate flips. Uh, but, the, but I still maintain that there's limits to what they can do. The White House has the ability on their own and EPA to move forward, and they will. Make no mistake about it. It's a legacy issue. Gene has been very clear. This rule's not getting, getting rolled back. Gene is not going back in the bottle. And they absolutely will be on time next summer with the final rule. Close with one thing I said earlier. It's the, it's the, the Rolling Stones slide, and I've used this one before. Folks, regardless of what you do with state or local lawmakers, remember what I said. If you go in constructive engagement, keep your powder dry until you absolutely have to. Ignore the reporters. Apologies to the press if you're in the room. And whatever you do, focus on what you need on behalf of your constituency not your wish list. I'm going to stop there. I'm sorry I ran over. Thank you very much. Thanks, Quinn. We'll take maybe two questions, and then uh, Quinn has uh, been willing to participate on the panel that will follow, so I suspect there may be some bleed over on other questions, or at that time you can ask other questions then. So if you want to ask a couple now, then we'll have our panel come up, and I'm sure you can have a chance to take a second bite at the apple then. Any questions? Any questions? Excellent. Wow. All right. Seeing none, thank you. I, I, I succeeded in irritating everybody a little bit. Thank you. <laughs> so.